Let me first say that I am one of a number of, as we like to call ourselves, radical Christian theologians. Indeed, in part, I should not use the word Christian, since as Death of God theologians, we've now been joined by a distinguished Jewish theologian, Dr. Richard Rubenstein, who spoke from this chapel not long ago. But I speak not for myself so much, I don't think, but rather for a movement which I believe is gaining power and momentum in Christian theological circles today. And I would like to emphasize that for us, the primary words, God is dead, are words recording a confession of faith. Let me be strict in emphasizing that at least so far as our intention is concerned, we intend to be speaking in faith, not to be speaking as unbelievers, not to be speaking as those who would call the church to an abandonment of everything that it once believed or to an abandonment of its primal faith, but rather are attempting to speak in the context of a new movement of faith, a, a radical movement of faith, a movement which attempts on the one hand to return to the primal ground of the Christian faith and on the other hand intends to give expression to that ground in terms of the context of contemporary history and reality. Now, the words, God is dead, or the death of God, are, of course, of fundamental importance here. And I think that if any attention at all is given to these words, it will be seen that this is not ordinary atheism. Because the ordinary atheist, of course, does not believe in God, does not believe that there is now or ever has been a God. Whereas we are attempting to say that God himself is God, and yet has died as God in Jesus Christ as a means of embodying himself redemptively in the world. And in saying that God is dead, we're attempting to say that the transcendent ground, the ultimate, final ground of world, life, existence, has died. Has died in such a way as to embody himself redemptively in Christ, has redied to make possible a final reconciliation of himself with the world. So that, indeed, the word death here is of extreme importance. I would like to ask you to remember, since we're so want to forget it, that in one sense, at least, Christianity has always been grounded in a faith in the death of God. That is to say, insofar as Christianity in its orthodox and normative expressions has affirmed that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, while at the same time affirming that Christ has died and has died redemptively for man, it certainly has affirmed, if only implicitly, that God has died in Christ. And this, indeed, is, is the strand, shall we say, of the Christian faith which we are attempting to reappropriate and to make real in the context of the modern world. Now, what can it mean to say that God has died in Christ? One of our favorite words is the Greek word kenosis, which in some sense has to do with an emptying process or a self-emptying process. Now, it's true that we use this word in a way which is not strictly speaking biblical or scriptural but which merely has a ground in Paul's letter to the Philippians, but which we believe indeed is indeed the implicit ground of the original Christian proclamation. And we're attempting to say that in Christ, God himself, the sovereign transcendent Lord, the source and ground of all that is, has emptied himself of his own original plenitude, of his own original transcendent sovereignty, glory, and transcendence, has taken upon himself the form of a servant, has become man in Jesus Christ, and become man in such a way to effect an ultimate and final transformation and transfiguration of all things whatsoever. We repudiate the idea that God became man in Christ and then in some sense annulled his humanity by returning to a spiritual realm and insist instead that the incarnation 
is a forward movement, an ever-increasing forward movement, wherein the original death of God in Christ becomes ever more actual and real in the world. Now, this kind of thinking or this kind of language appears to be paradoxical and absurd. But many of the reasons why it's, it appears to be absurd are uh, fallacious in terms of the fundamental grounds of Christianity. For example, most people commonly, if only implicitly, believe that God as God is an eternal, unchanging, impassive being. And that an eternal, unchanging, impassive being cannot die. Of course, one might also add that such a being also cannot suffer. Such a being also cannot act. Such a being cannot become manifest in the world. So that my initial response to uh, such criticism is simply to say that you are speaking from a non-Christian understanding of God and one which I as a Christian repudiate. We are rather attempting to understand God as the God who as Lord, as transcendent Lord and Creator, becomes flesh himself undergoes a transformation, undergoes a process of self-negation or self-annihilation, negating himself as transcendent Lord so that he may pass into flesh, so that he may become flesh, so that indeed he may become embodied in concrete time and space, embodied in Jesus Christ and embodied in that process that movement, that energy, that life that derives from Christ and which the Christian believes is even now in the process of renewing and transfiguring all things whatsoever and preparing all things so that they may pass into a final apocalyptic redemptive end. Now, from my point of view, to confess, and again I insist upon this, this is a confession of faith, is in no sense a rational statement, certainly not a logical deduction. But to confess that God has died in Christ is to believe that God himself has truly, actually, finally, and completely entered the world in Christ, has fully become embodied in time and space in Christ, has emptied himself, as I said, of his own original plenitude, therein darkening and emptying the transcendent realm and releasing the fullness of his own life and power into the world as a source of life and redemption so that finally, as Paul says, God may become all in all. So that here to confess the death of God is simply a means of confessing the life and indeed the redemptive life of Jesus Christ. Now, this kind of language, of course, not only takes place in the context of a confession of faith, it also takes place in the context of a conviction or a belief that a radical transformation, in some sense of all things, whether actually or potentially, has occurred in Christ. And I think that this is perhaps the most important point that has to be made by a death of God theology, and one that for many reasons is most elusive, and I should like to elucidate it, if only briefly, tonight. Herein, to speak of the death of God is to speak of a movement of God himself from transcendence to eminence, from spirit to flesh. It is to speak of a divine process, a forward-moving process with an eschatological or final goal, a process in some sense moving from an original beginning to a final end, and a process which itself initiates, affects, and embodies a total transformation of all reality whatsoever. Now, of course, in our Christian tradition, we have many symbolic ways of speaking of this transformation, such as, for example, the movement of spirit into flesh, or the movement of spirit to flesh. But I think we have to understand this in a comprehensive sense. We have to have some sense of an ultimate transfiguration of all things whatsoever. 
we're in. God himself, who reveals himself in faith, in the covenant which he established with Israel, to be the creator and Lord of all things whatsoever. But to be a creator and Lord who is a redemptive creator and Lord, who acts in such a way as to reveal himself, and he reveals himself in such a way to effect a redemption of humanity and indeed of the cosmos itself. And here, redemption is not by any means to be understood in a subjective or pietistic sense, but rather to be understood as a transfiguration, a transformation of all reality whatsoever. Here, as it were, we find a kind of process of reversal. As God in becoming flesh, as Word in becoming flesh, empties himself of his own transcendent power and glory, therein not simply investing the cosmos, man, in history with a new power and a new life, but transforming all reality whatsoever so that, if you will, the weight of reality or the center of gravity of reality itself, now comes the lie in flesh, in the world, in time, in life in energy, in movement. Now, the Christian, of course, believes that this process is fundamentally grounded in Jesus Christ. And the Christian, by one means or another, believes that Christ is the source of all which he knows is salvation, of all which he knows is life, of all which he knows is hope and redemption. And the death of God theology is attempting to say that the fullness The totality of God himself is embodied, is made flesh in Christ in such a way that that original divine reality is itself emptied of its pre-incarnate power and glory by the process of its becoming incarnate in Christ. Now here again we have a problem. The problem is, if God died in Christ, How is it that we can speak of the death of God in the modern world? How can we speak of the death of God as an event in modern history? Now, in one sense, the answer to this is quite simple. And the answer, of course, is that the coming of Christ did not immediately affect the total transfiguration of all things, that the coming of Christ did not immediately embody redemption for all. That what the Christian knows as redemption is in some sense a gradual process. It's not a process which occurs immediately at one instant of time and affects something that therein is eternally achieved. But rather, Christ himself is the movement, the embodiment of God's movement in the world, and that Christ himself is a forward-moving continual life and energy which continues to be present in the world and continues to act until that final day when all things will be reconciled, when all will know life. So in a very real sense, if we speak of the death of God as a redemptive event, then the death of God has not been consummated so long as redemption itself is not complete. And obviously redemption is not complete. Obviously, we live in a world of sin, of darkness, of perversity, of injustice, etc. Therefore, if we understand the death of God as a redemptive event, the death of God cannot yet be complete, cannot yet be finally realized or consummated, and the Christian does not believe that it will be consummated until the apocalypse. Nevertheless, it's my conviction that we must be called to realize that Christ himself is in no sense to be identified solely with Jesus of Nazareth. And that despite scriptural statements to this effect, Christ himself is at least literally not to be thought of as being the same yesterday, today, and forever. That Christ himself is the embodiment of a forward-moving process, of a process of reversing all things whatsoever, of making possible in certain sense the renewal of all things whatsoever, of making possible the coming together of all things whatsoever into a new totality, a new life, a new energy, a new joy. Therefore, in a very real sense, 
The body of Christ is an ever enlarging, ever more comprehensive, ever more universal body. It's in no sense to be confined to a particular space and time. It's in no sense to be confined to a particular image or a particular shape or a particular substance. It's rather by the Christian, it seems to me, to be thought of as the source of all life and energy whatsoever. Therefore, I think that we are called to understand the death of God as having for ourselves, at least, two foci, two poles. On the one hand, we affirm in faith that God has died in Jesus Christ that God has emptied himself of his divine glory in Christ, there in initiating or there in effecting in an original and decisive sense the process of redemption. But on the other hand, the process of redemption is an historical process. It's a gradual process. It's a forward-moving process. It's an enlarging process as it moves in such a way as to carry the life of Christ to all men, to all experience, to all life whatsoever. Some of you remember the words of Paul in Romans, Romans 9, 11, where in effect Paul rejoices that the Jews did not believe in Christ, that is, all of the Jews. Because if all the Jews had believed, then the kingdom of God would have come immediately and the Gentiles would have been excluded from redemption. So that in a certain sense, the mere fact that this is a gradual process makes possible its reality as a universal process. Now, I think we also must come to understand that it is a process wherein a particular kind of actualization or realization occurs. Wherein that is to say, a primal, original event originally occurring in Jesus Christ is extended by this forward-moving process into the fullness of life, consciousness, experience, and energy. So that the movement of God in Christ, or the death of God in Christ, or the embodiment of God in Christ is gradually but decisively made manifest throughout the whole body of humanity, indeed throughout the whole body of the cosmos. And here I think we have to draw a distinction, as I say, between two forms or foci of the death of God. On the one hand, God dies in Jesus Christ so as to make possible redemption. On the other hand, this original death of God in Jesus Christ is gradually but decisively carried by the forward movement of Christ himself into the fullness of humanity in the world. Now, it seems to me that we in the modern world know a particular form of the death of God that was not known to our forefathers of at least 200 years ago. That is to say, in a certain sense, we are living in an era which is witnessing the consummation, in a certain sense, of this process. We are living in a time in which the death of God is becoming corporately, communally present to all men whatsoever. So that every man who now lives in that history following the advent of Christ lives decisively in a time of the death of God and inescapably must live in a reality in which he no longer can know the presence or the reality of the transcendent Lord. Must inevitably live in a time of the eclipse of God or the silence of God or the absence of God. Now the common atheist or the unbeliever can know that ours is a time in which God is absent and there seems to be a little controversy about that. But I believe only in faith can we know that God is dead, that God is finally absent, that we are indeed heirs of a movement of God himself wherein this original death of God in Christ has finally penetrated the whole body of consciousness, experience, and world. So that now every man who lives in the history following the advent of Christ lives the death of God insofar as he lives in history at all.
And therein every man participates in the body of Christ insofar as the body of Christ incorporates and embodies the death of God. Now, I believe that the Christian can rejoice in the death of God. He can rejoice in the loss of transcendence. He can even rejoice in the new chaos, the new darkness into which we have been hurled or thrown by our own destiny. He can rejoice because, in a certain sense, he can know this as the consummation of God's original movement in Christ. And he can rejoice because he can know that he is liberated from any kind of transcendent ground, from any kind of awesome mystery, from any kind of ultimate norm, from any kind of final mystery, from any kind of beyond, and therein is released for a fullness, for a totality of life and energy here and now in the world and can know the fullness of life and energy as the present incarnate body of Christ. And it's precisely insofar as we are liberated from any sense whatsoever of the reality of God that we can participate fully and joyously in the world and the time and flesh before us and can celebrate that world as the body of Christ, as the new epiphany of God present to us in a totally incarnate, totally eminent form as God has emptied himself of his transcendent power and become flesh in such a way as to release us for a total life and fresh therein preparing all things whatsoever for their consummation in a final apocalypse in which God will become all in all and become all in all precise because he has died as God to make possible a reconciliation of all things with each other to realize therein a totally new life of redemption, joy, and love in Jesus Christ. Thank you. I think all of us should be greatly pleased at the brief and succinct summary that Dr. Altizer has given of his position. Uh, he has not advanced his position from the published writings which he has brought out in the last uh, two or three years, but he certainly has given uh, a clean-cut uh, indication to this group of the theological approach that he takes, and my remarks will be directed uh, to this position. Three weeks after the publication of my book, The Is God Dead Controversy, in, in August of last year, I received a letter from Professor Altizer in which he said, How I wish that you had responded to my wager in the gospel of Christian atheism. The wager in question is posed at the end of his book and constitutes his challenge to the historic Christian faith. He calls modern man to a new risk of faith, to the faith which he has described here, to a wager that Christ is not the same yesterday, today, and forever, that the God of Orthodox Christian theism is dead, that Christ's contemporary presence negates his previous appearances, his previous epiphanies, and that the only genuine Christ is a totally profane Christ. As a writer in the October 1966 Journal of Religion put it, <clears throat> better than he realizes, we must now enter the, the intoxicating world of Thomas J.J. Altizer. Uh, intoxicating is le mot juste, uh, for his views both represent and carry to their logical conclusions the hangover conditions prevailing in Protestant theological circles since the advent of modernism. And Professor Altizer is aiding and abetting a true days of wine and roses atmosphere in contemporary Christianity. Uh, the first section of this critique uh, is entitled Three Roads to Religious Absurdity. Professor Altizer, a lover of mystical intuitionist poets such as Blake, appreciates literary indirection in making a point. I therefore begin with a modern parable. Once upon a time, there was a man who thought he was dead. <clears throat> His concerned wife and friend sent him to the friendly neighborhood psychiatrist. Uh, the psychiatrist determined to cure him by convincing him of one fact that contradicted his belief that he was dead. The fact the psychiatrist settled on was the simple truth that dead men do not bleed and put the patient to work reading medical texts, observing autopsies, etc. After weeks of effort, the patient finally said, All right, all right, you've convinced me, dead men do not bleed. Whereupon the psychiatrist stuck him in the arm with a needle, and the blood flowed. The man looked down with a contorted, ashen face and cried, Good Lord, dead men bleed after all. Uh, this parable well illustrates that if you hold unsound presuppositions with sufficient tenacity, facts will make no difference at all, and you will be able to create a world of your own totally unrelated to reality and totally incapable of being touched by reality. Such a condition, which the philosophers call solipsistic, psychiatrists call autistically psychotic, and lawyers call simply insane, uh, is tantamount to death, for connection with the living world is severed. 
The man in the parable not only thought he was dead, in a very real sense he was dead, for facts no longer meant anything to him. I think that it can be shown that Professor Altizer is in this lamentable condition and that his death of God theology is a projection of his own solipsistic death on his creator and redeemer. Consider the three presuppositions which cut Professor Altizer off from religious reality and make it virtually impossible for him to face facts theologically. First, he dumps the law of contradiction <clears throat> on which, as Russell and White had demonstrated in their monumental Principia Mathematica, all logical thinking is based and substitutes for it Hegel's so-called dialectic logic. Says Altizer in the Gospel of Christian Atheism, so long as theological thinking is grounded in the logical laws of identity and contradiction, it cannot apprehend a forward-moving and self-transfiguring word. Hegel insisted that it is only when dialectic understanding, Vernunft, has negated and transcended the logical laws of pure reason, Verstand, that thinking can apprehend the movement of spirit in history. Unquote. The fundamental problem here is the utter irrationality of so-called dialectic logic, which, as Bertrand Russell has shown, is not a logic at all, but a disguised metaphysic. If thinking were really to be governed by dialectic standards, then we could know absolutely nothing and could not, in fact, even state the simplest fact. Why? Because each fact or idea could be understood only in terms of its further development in antithesis and synthesis. That is, knowledge of any particular would be possible only in light of the whole of existent reality, Hegel's absolute idea. Now, this is all very well, comments Russell, but it is open to an initial objection. If the above argument were sound, how could knowledge ever begin? I know numbers of propositions of the form A is the father of B, but I do not know the whole universe. If all knowledge were knowledge of the universe as a whole, there would be no knowledge. This is enough to make us suspect a mistake somewhere. Uh, this illustrates an important truth, namely that the worse your logic, the more interesting the consequences to which it gives rise." Unquote. In locating the origin of Western dialectic thinking in Heraclitus, Altizer unfortunately does not reflect sufficiently on the reconstructed but genuine Heraclitian fragment, Panta re uden du mene, Panta core kai uden mene. Everything flows and nothing abides, everything gives way and nothing stays fixed. Out of flux, nothing but flux. Out of Altizer's flux, nothing but irrational theological flux. If Professor Altizer really wishes to employ a credo quia absurdum, I believe it because it's absurd, approach to life and theology, let him consider full well that modern man has many more irrational options to choose from than his own. There are, in fact, an infinite number of irrational, unverifiable religious possibilities open at any time. We shall consider some especially juicy examples shortly. Why Altizer's brand of theological irrationality? But to answer the question, the good professor would have to offer a reason, and that would require the acceptance of the law of non-contradiction. Professor Altizer's second presuppositional road to religious absurdity is his conviction that there is an underlying unity of thought between Eastern mystical religion and the Christian faith, that in some sense nirvana can be identified with the kingdom of God and Buddha with the Christ. Here he claims as his spiritual father the greatest living phenomenologist of religion, Mircea Eliade who finds a coincidence of opposites in primitive Eastern and Western religious experience. But here, as in so many other instances, Altizer runs while he reads and suffers the consequences. In conversation with me a week ago this evening, Professor Eliade made this very point about Christianity's unique historical focus on a once-for-all incarnation of God in Christ, expressed his dissatisfaction with Professor Altizer's interpretation of his conjunction of opposites. Uh, Eliade's dialectic, unlike Altizer's, is descriptive, not normative, and involves no higher synthesis. The sacred and the profane exist simultaneously, and stated that, frankly, he could not understand Altizer's theological writings, including a full-length work which Professor Altizer has written about Professor Eliot. I was, reminded, <laughs> I was reminded of Macaulay's remark on reading Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. In this day and age, it is unfortunate that one intelligent man cannot write so that another intelligent man can understand him. The third a priori, which Professor Altizer uh, uh, by which Professor Altizer cuts himself off from religious reality is his uncritical acceptance of scientific biblical criticism. He feels justified in wagering for a mythical, totally profane Jesus, totally canonic Jesus, because everyone must recognize that, quote, modern New Testament scholarship has for the most part dissolved the image of Jesus in the Christian tradition, leading to the acknowledgement, if only on the basis of the gospel accounts of his teaching, that Jesus will be present to later ages in strange and paradoxical forms, unquote. 
In reply, we could raise the painfully obvious point that if the New Testament picture of Jesus has in fact been dissolved, then Altizer will not even be able to abstract from it a Schweitzerian apocalyptic Jesus, much less a Jesus present to later ages in strange and paradoxical forms. But the premise does not even need to be granted, and must not if one is going to stay with the facts. The debelius boltmann form geschicklicke methode form critical method which in Professor Altizer's judgment has dissolved the image of Jesus as a historical redeemer, has itself largely been dissolved. For example, A.N. Sherwin White in his 1960-61 Serum Lectures, Roman Law, Society and Roman Law in the New Testament, and Sherwin White is no theologian at all, said this, It is astonishing that while Greco-Roman historians have been growing in confidence, the 20th century study of the gospel narrative, starting from no less promising material, has taken so gloomy a turn in the development of form criticism that the more advanced exponents of it apparently maintain, so far as an amateur can understand the matter, that the historical Christ is unknowable and the history of his mission cannot be written. This seems very curious when one compares the case for the best-known contemporary of Christ, who, like Christ, is a well-documented figure, Tiberius Caesar. Sherwin White shows that the evidence in behalf of Tiberius Caesar historically is vastly inferior to that for Jesus, and yet one has no doubts whatever about the uh, general outlines of Tiberius Caesar's career, his motives, etc. Astonishing and curious indeed, but only if one is unacquainted with the degree to which contemporary theologians, such as Professor Altizer, uncritically absorb methodological presuppositions that keep them in principle from discovering a clear historical portrait of Jesus in the primary documents. Our second section is entitled, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? Professor Altizer's threefold path Dialectic opposition to the laws of logic, religious syncretism, form critical destruction of the historical Jesus leads not to nirvana or to the kingdom of God, but to a fully canonic word, a fully hidden word, which he has described earlier. The obvious question is, suppose we want to be spiritual or apocalyptic Christians, a la Altizer, in the presence of a fully hidden Jesus, how will we find the new and more comprehensive and universal Jesus? At first, we may hope that the word kenosis will help us, since the word describes Christ emptying himself in his incarnation, Philippians 2. But even the most elementary exegesis of this New Testament passage shows that any resemblance between the canonic theories of contemporary liberal theology, to say nothing of Altizer's kenosis, and the biblical teaching, is purely coincidental. Eugene R. Fairweather, after examining the whole canonic question in detail, this is in the appendix to F.W. Beer's Philippians, one of the standard commentaries, says, it can hardly be claimed that canonicism is explicitly contained in the New Testament picture of Christ. Rather, it depends on a complicated deduction involving highly debatable presuppositions. In the severe words of Pius XII, it turns the integral mystery of the incarnation of, and of redemption into bloodless and empty specters. Bloodless and empty specters, Pius XII had Professor Altizer's number. But Professor Altizer cuts himself off even from the New Testament concept of kenosis. Such a reality cannot be understood wholly uh, by a word of the past, not even by the word kenosis. Fine, then how do we recognize it? If today's Christ is totally hidden, if he has totally ceased to be himself, what is he? From a contradiction, anything follows. Is he then a billboard, a toasted cheese sandwich? Love, as Professor Altizer suggests in the concluding sentence of his Gospel of Christian Atheism. Hate, that possibility is as open as any other. Totalitarianism, genocide. Let us consider a few examples of the Christ people have found when they have given up, as has Altizer, the historical Christ of the New Testament documents. In the 19th century, we had, uh, for example, uh, David Lazaretti, a religious mystic. He adopted a singular emblematic device, the double C, about which he was most concerned, which stood for the first and second Christ, Christ the son of Joseph of Nazareth and Christ the son of the late Joseph Lazaretti of Arsidoso. He entreated all true believers to disassociate themselves from the world by abstaining from food and from sexual intercourse, even in the case of married persons, who, however, if they indulged, were required to pray for at least two hours naked outside the bed. Concluding his exhortation by declaring himself to be the man of mystery, the new Christ, the leader and avenger. Unquote. Then we have Meher Baba, the patron saint of Sufism reoriented. We won't go into him. <clears throat> the previous examples, though bizarre, are in the general category of the, in of the inane. Consider now not the silly but the sinister consequences of fully hidden Christ. We have, for example, the <clears throat> late Satanist, philanderer, and narcotics addict, Aleister Crowley, uh, who appropriately called himself the Great Beast. Uh, this is how Crowley described Christ. 
Christ the Savior was only the pseudo-Christ. Christ's enemy was Satan, therefore the devil is not so bad as he is painted. Indeed, he is a worthy ally. Together, they will make war on Christ. And with his destruction, the real Lord of the universe will arise, the God beyond God, at the end of the uh, universal process. Crowley was only one Satanist. The theologians of the Deutsche Christen movement in Hitler's Germany were many, and they justified genocidal activity on practically the same grounds as Altizer justifies his opposition to traditional religious and ethical teaching. The new age has dawned. Christ must not be conceived in New Testament terms as a Jew, for example, but in terms of the dynamic contemporary life process in which we are involved. Now, they happen to be involved in the life process of National Socialism. They identified Christ with that, and they said that we must not use the New Testament documents as any criterion of how Christ operates in the present scene. Thank God Professor Altizer is living in the America of the 60s and not in the Germany of the 30s, because in principle, the life force could as well apply to the totalitarian genocide of the Third Reich as it could to the ongoing situation where the action is at the present time. The next section, Russian roulette as a theological principle. While optimistic churchmen such as President James McCord of Princeton Seminary are joyously heralding a whole new era in theology characterized by Professor Altizer's stress on the spirit, the God of the present, Altizer himself is dimly aware of the ghastly Pandora's box his theology may be opening up. In discussing his wager in the closing pages of the Gospel of Christian Atheism, he writes, the contemporary Christian who bets that God is dead must do so with a full realization that he may well be embracing a life-destroying nihilism. In ordinary life, a wager involves odds, and odds are determined by the weighing of evidence. No man in his right mind will take on a wager, endangering his life or the lives of others, unless powerful reasons compel him to do so. But where are the odds in favor of Altizer's religious option? We have already seen that the roads leading to his canonic Christ are utterly irrational, and that his third age of the spirit is without a redeeming feature. The scholarship which Professor Altizer displays in his writings ought in itself to show how meaningless his wager is. Consider this simple example, the bibliographical note to his Gospel of Christian Atheism, which commences with the incredible assertion, the primary sources of this book are the writings of Blake, Hegel, and Nietzsche. Why not Edna St. Vincent Millay, Omar Khayyam, and Edgar Guest? Perhaps the essence of the Christian Gospel is to be found in those immortal, compelling, future-orientated lines of W.S. Gilbert. Come, mighty must, inevitable shall, in thee I trust. Time we is my coronal. Go mocking is, go disappointing was. That I am this, ye are the cursed cause. Yet humble second shall be first, I ween, and dead and buried be the cursed has been. O weak might be, O may might could should would. How powerless ye for evil or for good. In every sense your moods I cheerless call. Whate'er your tense, ye are imperfect all. Ye have deceived the trust I've shown in ye. Away, the mighty must alone shall be. How long would even an undergraduate, to say nothing of a doctoral student, last at this university if he attempted to determine the nature of the Muslim faith through such primary sources? Perhaps the true understanding of Napoleonic policy can be discovered in Dunn, Keats, and Ayn Rand. Such an approach to the essence of the Christian gospel, an approach that ignores and bypasses the historical documents concerning Christ, is a travesty of scholarship. And what about the primary sources Professor Altizer does choose? We have already discussed Hegel's illogical logic, Nietzsche went insane in his last years, and the visionary Blake, who identified art with Jesus, conversed with his dead brother and numerous other spirits, and claimed that they dictated poems to him. Quote, Thirteen years ago I lost a brother, and with his spirit I converse daily and hourly. I hear his advice, and even now write from his dictate. I write when commanded by the spirit, and the moment I have written I see the words fly about the room in all directions. It is then published, and the spirits can read, assuming that they can get to their local neighborhood bookstore, of course. Granting Hegel's brilliant insights, Nietzsche's penetrating criticisms, and Blake's poetic raptures, what do they necessarily have to say about the essence of Christianity or the de facto truth of religious claims? But Blake's spirits and Altizer's third age of the spirit are indeed intimately related. They are comparable gibberish. Though they tell us much about their proponents psychologically, they tell us nothing about the subject under discussion, namely the nature and validity of the Christian truth claim. In fact, the more one encounters such visionary scholarship in Altizer, obfuscated as it is in an impenetrable jungle of neo-Hegelian jargon, the more one recalls H.L. Mencken's classic description of the work of Warren Gamaliel Harding, and note the dialectic counterpoint integral to the evaluation. 
It reminds me of a string of wet sponges. It reminds me of tattered washing on the line. It reminds me of stale bean soup, of college yells, of dogs barking idiotically through endless nights. It is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. It drags itself out of the dark abysm of pish and crawls insanely up the topmost pinnacle of posh. It is rumble and bumble. It is flap and doodle. It is balder and dash. Altizer's wager is exactly this, and yet it is not even a wager in the gentleman's sense involving odds and evidence. It is a suicidal game of Russian roulette in which all chambers of the weapon are loaded against the theological gambler and in which one's chances are 100% in favor of blowing one's eternal brains out. Uh, next, <clears throat> the premature demise of a precocious theologian. In September 1955, a doctoral dissertation on psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung's understanding of religion was submitted to the University of Chicago Divinity School faculty. The candidate concluded his study with the following testimony of faith, quote, Jung's basic weakness, which proceeds out of the most basic principles of his thought, is that he is incapable of finding meaning or reality in the historical foundations of religion. This writer is an Anglican who accepts the canonical authority of the Bible as well as the ecclesiastical authority of the creeds and practices of the ancient church Catholic as normative standards for Christian life and belief. He believes that Christianity is nothing if it is not founded on the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and that without its Christological foundations as normatively established by the ancient church, it cannot preserve its authentic nature. Therefore, he is forced to reject Jung's conception of Christianity as well as his conception of the figure of Christ. That Jesus Christ is wholly a mythical figure arising from the deeper processes of the collective unconscious, which has artificially been engrafted by tradition into the insignificant figure of history, Jesus of Nazareth, this writer cannot in any sense accept. Jung's interpretation as it stands cannot possibly be incorporated into the classical structure of the Christian faith." Unquote. Incredibly, the author of this passage, who so precisely describes the fundamental error in current death of God thinking, the absorption of the historical Christ into a mythical Christ, is Thomas J.J. J. Altizer, the author a decade later of the Gospel of Christian Atheism. How could such a complete volt fast, such an extreme counter-conversion have occurred in so brief a time? The answer, it is a very instructive one, is that even in his earliest graduate work at the University of Chicago Divinity School, Altizer had picked up certain presuppositions that would eventually eat away the foundations of his faith in historical Christianity. His Master of Arts thesis on the concepts of nature and grace in Augustine's theology, June 51, concludes on the theme of the Augustine dialectic and with the hope that, quote, the conflicting truths which it, the problem of nature and grace, embodies may be seen to point to a higher synthesis and the possibility of the retention of all the truths which they embody through a dialectical synthesis that unites these contrary concepts by incorporating the truth in each. Already, the requirements of clear logical thinking are being sacrificed in the interests of a dialectic logic. In his doctoral work on Jung's thought, Altizer's difficulties become even more apparent. He recognizes the dangers of Jung's innate hostility toward reason and history, but is fascinated by the psychologist's mythical, poetic, religious insights. While refusing at any cost to accept the dissolution of reason, nature, and history, which entails not only the destruction of the worldview of empirical science, he says, but of the reality of the Christian faith as well, he seeks to bring the conflicting poles of science and art together through some form of dialectical thinking, and the latter will necessitate a return to the problems of Hegel, Schilling, Kierkegaard, and Nietzsche. Alt Altizer did not realize it, but to enter the presuppositional domain of these thinkers was in itself to give up the possibility of retaining objective truth, since in differing ways all four reject the subject-object distinction. As a matter of fact, in the preface to his doctoral dissertation, Professor Altizer opts in favor of William Dilthey's interpretation of uh, history, uh, in which Dilthey uh, says that it's impossible uh, to make a subject-object distinction in history and that one must participate in the historical subject matter in which one is engaged. This reminds one a bit of Robert Benchley, who describes his uh, college biology uh, laboratory course as follows, that he spent the term drawing the uh, image of his own eyelash projected by the microscope onto the slide. Altizer's capitulation to Dilthian historiography was in no sense necessary and could not have been more disastrous. The application of the insights of analytical philosophy to historical thinking, Danto's Analytical Philosophy of History, W.H. Dre's Philosophical Analysis in History, etc., has shown how unjustifiable was Dilthian's attempt to transcend the subject-object distinction. 
J.W.N. Watkins in Kobanski's La Philosophie au Milieu du XXe siècle makes the vital point over against the Dilsey tradition that recent analytical work by such philosophers as Ryle, quote, dispels the old presumption to which Hayek, Swabby, and others are still inclined that to understand Genghis Khan, the historian must be someone very like Genghis Khan. Unquote. If one gives up historical objectivity, one perforce gives up at the same time the possibility of objective knowledge of the present. For the past is, in a very real sense, nothing but the sloughing off of the present. And the result is a solipsistic relativism in which even one's own existence and identity come under question. In such a philosophical and theological bog has Professor Altizer managed to engulf himself. The remarkable thing is that he has achieved such catastrophic results in such a short time. It generally takes professional academicians a lifetime to destroy themselves as thoroughly as Professor Altizer has done in a decade. Perhaps, however, and we fervently hope for it, the next decade will display a recovery on his part no less remarkable than the collapse we have sadly documented. He is capable of it, and the lights in the father's house still burn, awaiting the return of the prodigal from the Hegelian far country to his baptismal and ordination vows. No ordination now. <clears throat> uh, that's easy to delete. That's only two words. <laughs> uh, now some final remarks uh, under the rubric, the supreme irony of, our, of an archaic radicalism and the supreme glory of an eternally relevant Christ. In his lecture at DePaul University six days ago, Professor Altizer stressed the continuity between his thought and mainline Protestant emphases in the 20th century and endeavored quite successfully to show how his theology carried to consistent conclusions basic themes in neo-orthodoxy, existentialism, and Talichianism. What is seldom recognized, however, is the degree to which these Protestant theological positions themselves depend on the 19th century presuppositions which Professor Altizer's work so fully displays. 19th century dialectic thinking, with its destruction of historical objectivity and the subject-object distinction, uh, uh, is manifest in varying but significant degrees in Bart, Boltmann, and Tillich. I've got an article on this in Lutherischer Rundblick titled Lutherischer Hermeneutik und Hermeneutik heute. The 19th century history of religion blend of Christ with non-historical Eastern faiths became a vital motif in Tillich's thinking. There's an article forthcoming in Semelios on this. The scientific biblical criticism of the 19th century, firmly rooted in anti-miraculous Newtonian natural law thinking, became an integral element in all mainline 20th century Protestant theological scholarship. And the subjectivism of Kierkegaard, Blake, and Nietzsche has borne fruit in contemporary existential theology. What Altizer has done is uncritically to pick up these 19th century a priori from his 20th century masters, refine them, garnish them with a liberal dose of the cultural optimism for which the 19th century has become justly infamous, he has then served them, piping hot from the fire of his personality and salted with an obscure, mystifying literary style to men hungry for religious truth in the 20th century. But the meal should not so much as receive mention in the theological Michelin's guide, for it is nothing but warmed over hash. Altizer's radicalism is impossibly archaic and pre-modern, and its presuppositions, as we have been at pains to show, are discredited at every point. Altizer and his confrères in the Death of God movement have simply demonstrated beyond all question the bankruptcy of dialectic and liberal theologies in our time and the absolute necessity to make a fresh start. At DePaul, Professor Altizer was perceptibly asked by a member of his audience to relate his Death of God theology to science. He declined, quote, to engage in scientific dialogue, unquote, on the ground that he was not sufficiently acquainted with scientific thought to do so. Here the archaism of his approach was especially manifest. Ours is above all a day of scientific empirical concern, but scientific in an open Einsteinian way that the 19th century mind cannot even comprehend. As we rapidly approach century 21, men are looking for tangible, objective evidence on which to build their religious life, and they are not about to close off areas of possible truth because natural laws prohibit. Natural laws are but generalizations dependent on objective, experiential data. What modern man insists on, above all, is a verifiable base for his faith so that he can bring some order out of the conflicting welter of religious claims. He is sick to death of verbal panaceas of autobiography masking as theology, of the naive confusion of cultural trends with religious truth, of the theologian who hypnotizes himself by his own terminology and leaves no possible means of confirming what he says. The Delphic oracle phase in modern theology is almost over, and in Thomas J.J. Altizer you may well be seeing its last, soon-to-be-extinct 
representative. Into this theological vacuum, the historical Christ, who is Pace Altizer, still the same yesterday, today, and forever, comes in maximum relevance. When contemporary man goes to the historical records, which according to uh, Georges Tavas in dealing with Tillich have never been destroyed, he finds a Jesus who speaks and acts as God incarnate and who takes the self-centeredness and self-deification of the centuries on himself at Calvary and rises again in demonstration that he has conquered once for all the powers of sin and death for men in every age. New religions come and go, but they are generally old religions in new garb, for outside of the gospel there is nothing new under the sun. In Thomas J.J. Altizer, you have another, albeit archaic, option presented to you in the marketplace of unverifiable metaphysical claims. Consider well before you buy. Caveat emptor. Recall the story of La, La Revelière and Talleyrand, as recounted by Duff Cooper in his biography of Talleyrand. Quote, La Revelière was a revolutionary of the feebler, doctrinaire, idealistic type. He bitterly hated the Christian religion and Carnot. In the place of the former, he had attempted to introduce a new pseudo-philosophical fad manufactured in England called theophilanthropy. Has a lot of secular parallels uh, to the view that you've just heard presented. On one occasion, he read a long paper explaining this novel system of worship to his colleagues. When he had concluded it and received the congratulations of the other ministers, Talleyrand remarked, for my part, I have only one observation to make. Jesus Christ, in order to found his religion, was crucified and rose again. You should have tried to do as much. To Professor Altizer, I say the same. You should have tried to do as much. Until you do, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the Lord who will still rule heaven and earth when debates like this are forgotten, when we ourselves are forgotten, and our children's children are forgotten. Then as today, men will believe and will have every reason to believe that the kingdoms of this world are one day to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever.